Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today, we're gonna to take another look at the NVIDIA driver overhead issue with some additional testing. Now, the goal of this video will be to try and better explain when, where, and why you'll run into this issue. Now, for those of you who haven't watched the previous video, I discovered in some recent Ryzen 5 testing that Radeon GPUs often performed quite a bit better than GeForce GPUs with older or low-end CPUs, like the Ryzen 5 1600. The reason being is that NVIDIA does the bulk of its scheduling via software, which leaves the CPU to do much of the heavy lifting. AMD, on the other hand, uses a hardware scheduler built into the GPU. NVIDIA's approach was beneficial for DirectX 11 games that typically lent heavily on the primary thread, as this is where the draw core processing is done for these older games. Using a software scheduler allowed NVIDIA to reduce the complexity of their GPUs while using more of the CPU with some driver magic to split up the draw calls and spread them across the available cores, most of which were doing very little anyway because, as I just mentioned, most DX11 games didn't use more than one to two cores. This was an excellent strategy that allowed NVIDIA to utilize more of the available hardware, which reduced the dependency on the main thread, and that meant GeForce GPUs would be less limited by the CPU when compared to competing Radeon GPUs. Today's video is sponsored by Gigabyte and their brand new range of Radeon RX 6700 XT graphics cards, including the Gaming OC and Aorus Elite. The Gaming OC is a high quality yet minimalistic graphics card, whereas the Aorus Elite adds a little extra bling with its RGB Fusion 2.0 lighting. Both models pack large triple slot WinForce 3X coolers featuring direct touch heat pipes, a full size aluminium backplate, and they're overclocked out of the box for maximum gaming performance. So for more information, please check the link in the video description. I should note that DirectX 11 does feature a multi-threading feature called command lists, but it has to be implemented by the game developer, and most just didn't bother. And that meant most DX11 titles were primarily single-threaded. Therefore, in order to achieve maximum performance, you need a highly clocked, high IPC processor, and this is what Intel delivered during the DirectX 11 era. So to recap, for DirectX 11 games, GeForce GPUs actually required more CPU resources to function, but because most games didn't come anywhere close to fully utilizing mainstream CPUs at the time, Nvidia's approach resulted in improved frame rates as they were leveraging more of the CPU. Fast forward to today, and most modern games have now moved to DirectX 12, which does support hardware scheduling, and that means draw call processing and submissions are natively supported on all CPU threads. Now you might think that that means the playing field has been leveled, and in a way it has. But because Nvidia still relies on the CPU for scheduling, there is some additional overhead there to separate the draw call submissions across the threads. Again, GeForce GPUs are still using more of the CPU to function, and this can see a performance regression if the game is already heavily utilizing the CPU. This is exactly what I saw in my four generations of Ryzen 5 benchmark video, when testing the Radeon and GeForce GPUs. I should note that I wasn't looking for this issue, and while I knew that it existed, I have to admit I wasn't expecting to find margins quite as large as I did. A lot of you were also quite alarmed by the results and started questioning if your GeForce GPU was limiting the performance of your system. But for most of you, it is unlikely that you'll run into this issue as you've probably got enough CPU resources to spare. Then there were others that believed we were making a mountain out of a molehill, as no one would pair an RTX 3090 with a Ryzen 5 1600X, but that really wasn't the issue either. Anyway, as I said earlier, the idea of this video is to provide even more testing that should make it clearer when and where the NVIDIA driver overhead can be a problem. Now, previously I only highlighted this issue in two games, Watch Dogs Legion and Horizon Zero Dawn, but I did note that I'd seen similar results in half a dozen other DirectX 12 titles that I'd already tested. So let's start by looking at a few more games and then we'll jump into even more follow-up testing with older processors along with some DirectX 11 versus DirectX 12 and Vulkan comparisons. For this first set of results, I used the Ryzen 5 1400 and Core i5 9400F as I wanted to look at more budget-friendly CPUs and the 9400F in particular was a very popular item. The Ryzen 5 5600X has also been included purely for comparison. All three CPUs have been tested using low latency DDR4 3200CL14 dual rank dual channel memory, though for a more realistic configuration, I went back and tested the 9400F with single rank DDR4 2666CL16 memory. Then for the GPUs, we have the RX 5600XT, RTX 2060, 
RX 6800 XT and RTX 3080. Not as many GPUs as I'd like, but it is a huge amount of work to test this many hardware configurations in seven games. And as you're about to see, this is only a small portion of the testing that I've produced for this video. Finally, I'm going to focus on the 1080p medium data, but I also have 1080p ultra as well as 1440p ultra medium, which will be made available to Floatplane and Patreon members. Starting with Assassin's Creed Valhalla. If you're using a lower tier GPU with an older CPU and you're looking to boost performance, 1080p medium is likely where you'd start. This saw the Ryzen 5 1400 average around 90 FPS with the 5600 XT, and the 9400F using DDR4 2666 memory delivered a similar result. That said, with much faster memory, the 9400F was able to match the Ryzen 5 5600X with almost 100 FPS. Now, when using the Ryzen 5 5600X, the 5600 XT is 21% faster than the RTX 2060. The margin remains much the same with the Core i5 9400F, but we find with the slower Ryzen 5 1400 that the Radeon GPU is a further 10% faster, extending the margin to 30%. However, more interesting than that is the fact that the Ryzen 5 1400 is 21% faster using the RX 5600 XT than it is with the RTX 3080, and that's due to the driver overhead. Basically, with a GeForce GPU, you're limited to a maximum of 75 FPS using an R5 1400, whereas frame rates can exceed 100 FPS with a Radeon GPU, as seen with the 6800 XT, which saw a 37% performance increase. Typically though, with more realistic hardware, you'd be looking more in the range of a 10-20% performance uplift, and again with an older or slower processor like the Ryzen 5 1400. Scaling in Cyberpunk 2077 is pretty similar for most of the hardware configurations tested, and it's really only the Ryzen 5 1400 that suffers from the additional driver overhead, dropping down from 68 FPS with the Radeon RX 5600 XT to just 57 FPS with the RTX 3080, or really any GeForce GPU for that matter. Basically, the low-end Radeon GPU offers 19% or better performance over all GeForce GPUs under these test conditions. In fact, you might be able to downgrade the Radeon GPU without seeing a performance loss, as the 5600 XT and 6800 XT delivered the same performance with the R5 1400. It's also worth noting that we saw a 33% improvement in 1% low performance, and that does have a significant impact on the gaming experience. So if you have an older first-gen Ryzen processor or a CPU that is equal to or worse than the R5 1400, your experience will be better in this title with a Radeon GPU. Now, Death Stranding isn't remotely CPU demanding, at least where I test. Therefore, despite being a DirectX 12 game, we see little to no difference between the GeForce and Radeon GPUs, even with the Ryzen 5 1400, as it had plenty of CPU resources to spare. So this is a good example of a game that won't see lower end CPU suffer when using a GeForce GPU, simply because it's not using much of the CPU. Testing with Horizon Zero Dawn shows the Radeon RX 5600 XT to be just 3% faster than the GeForce RTX 2060 when using the Ryzen 5 5600X. However, had I used the Ryzen 5 1400 for testing, we would have found the Radeon GPU to be 13% faster, or 17% faster when comparing the 1% low performance. Then if we remove the GPU limitation by using the RTX 3080 and 6800 XT, we find the slower R5 1400 is 19% faster when paired with the Radeon GPU. Now, Rainbow Six Siege isn't particularly CPU demanding, so I don't expect to see much difference here, as was the case with Death Stranding. That said, we do see a very small performance advantage for the Radeon GPUs when paired with the slower Ryzen 5 1400. For example, it was 5% faster with the 5600 XT than it was with the RTX 3080. So some driver overhead is creeping into these results, but the impact on performance is, what I would say, insignificant. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is a good example of a very CPU demanding DirectX 12 title, and here we're seeing some performance regression with the GeForce GPUs, even with the Core i5-9400F, at least when using the more realistic DDR4-2666 configuration. The Ryzen 5 1400 was good for 70 FPS on average, with a 1% low of about 55 FPS when using a Radeon GPU. That meant the Radeon RX 5600 XT was 19% faster than the RTX 3080 or any GeForce GPU for that matter. The Core i5-9400F using DDR4-2666 memory with the 5600 XT was good for 89 FPS on average, and that's an 11% increase over what it could do with even the RTX 3080. 
So from a GPU benchmark perspective, we're seeing a situation where the 5600 XT was just 5% faster than the RTX 2060 when paired with the Ryzen 5 5600X. However, when using a more budget-friendly CPU, such as the Core i5-9400F, the 5600 XT is seen to be 14% faster. So that's quite a big difference there, depending on the CPU used for testing. Watch Dogs Legion is one of the more CPU demanding titles I've tested with here, utilizing the 9400F at about 90 to 100%. As a result, both the 9400F and R5-1400 perform better with the Radeon GPUs. The R5-1400, for example, was good for 71 FPS with the 5600 XT, and that's a 20% increase over what it achieved with the much more powerful RTX 3080. The 9400F with DDR4-2666 memory was good for 88 FPS with the 5600 XT and then just 75 FPS with the RTX 2060. So 17% better performance with the Radeon GPU, though it did manage to claw back some of that performance with the RTX 3080, but even so it was 5% faster with what should be a much slower Radeon GPU. Okay, so those results line up pretty well with what was shown in the previous video. If the game is able to max out or come very close to maxing out the CPU, performance can be around 20% stronger with a Radeon GPU. At this point, other tech media outlets have confirmed these findings, so the evidence is pretty concrete. Now, what I wanna take a look at is Radeon and GeForce performance using a range of GPUs with an old but very popular processor. And for this, I've chosen the Haswell flagship part. So the Core i7-4790K. Not that long ago, this was considered to be one of the very best gaming CPUs on the market, and it's still a rather sought after part on the second-hand market. So how does the Core i7-4790K get on in today's games when armed with 16 gigabytes of DDR4-2133CL11 memory? Let's go take a look. For this set of results, I've included a few different games. One such game is F1 2020, and this isn't a particularly CPU demanding title, but it is a DirectX 12 title. The results here are quite interesting. For example, with a high-end CPU such as the 10900K, the GTX 1080 is around 25% faster than Vega 56 in this game, but here it's just 8% faster. And normally you'd put that down to a strong CPU bottleneck, but as you can see, there's a bit more to it as the GeForce GPUs cause the CPU to become the primary performance limiting component sooner than it would with a Radeon GPU. Here we can see that the RTX 3080 performance hits a wall at around 170 FPS, but with a Radeon GPU such as the 6700 XT, and likely even the 5700 XT, it's possible to squeeze a further 20% or more out of the system, 25% with the 6800 XT. Now the Fortnite results are heavily CPU limited. Here I'm testing using a replay from a late game Team Rumble match. So not nearly as demanding as a pro level scrim, but still, there's quite a bit going on and a good amount of builds. Historically, we've seen when testing with a flagship CPU, GeForce GPUs have delivered superior performance in Fortnite, and you'd expect the GTX 1060 to beat the RX 580, and if not, you'd surely expect the RTX 3080 to come out on top. Yet, the RX 580 offered 17% more performance than the RTX 3080, while Vega 56 was 22% faster. Pretty crazy stuff, but this is how performance is going to look in any DirectX 12 game that heavily utilizes the CPU. Again, the fact is you have around 20% more headroom with a Radeon GPU. Hitman's another DirectX 12 title that heavily utilizes the CPU, and again we find another situation where Vega 56 was faster than the RTX 3080 when using the Core i7-4790K, though here it was only 6% faster. Still, if you owned a Vega 56 graphics card and you upgraded to an RTX 3060 Ti, you'd actually end up losing around 10% performance in this title. The Horizon Zero Dawn results are quite interesting. Here the GTX 1060 was a whisker faster than the RX 580, but Vega 56 was slightly faster than the RTX 3060 Ti and GTX 1080. So we're seeing GPU limited performance with the 1060 and 580, and then CPU limited performance with the higher end GPUs. Basically, the performance cap with a GeForce GPU is around 116 FPS, whereas Radeon GPUs can be up to 22% faster, as seen when using the 6800 XT versus the RTX 3080. Red Dead Redemption 2 isn't overly CPU intensive, so here performance is mostly as expected. The GTX 1060 performance is terrible, but that's likely due to other factors.
Again, the Vulcan performance is quite good, and the driver overhead appears to be less of an issue here, though again, Rainbow Six Siege isn't particularly CPU intensive. Still, we are seeing an example here where the RTX 3060 Ti isn't an upgrade for a Vega 56 owner using a 4790K. Again, we're seeing that Watch Dogs Legion is a CPU intensive DirectX 12 title, and as a result, the RTX 3060 Ti is barely faster than an RX 580. In fact, here the RX 580 was able to match the GTX 1080. From the RTX 3060 Ti to Vega 56, we're looking at a 16% performance uplift, and then 21% to the 6700 XT. So again, it's very clear at this point that in DirectX 12 games, Nvidia's driver overhead can be a problem for certain hardware configurations, namely those where the CPU is heavily utilized. But what about DirectX 11? How do modern games behave when using DX11? At least when it's an option. Rainbow Six Siege is a great game to use as it started life out as a DirectX 11 only title. And being that it is very popular and quite old now, it has been fairly well optimized for both AMD and Nvidia hardware. That said, the low level API option is Vulkan. So this is a DirectX 11 versus Vulkan comparison. Using the previous generation mid-range GPUs, we can see that the slower Ryzen 5 1400 suffers much more using DirectX 11 as opposed to Vulkan, which makes sense. That said, with faster CPUs, the 5600 XT was actually around 5% faster using DirectX 11. Not something I necessarily expected to see, especially given performance was much the same using either API with an RTX 2060. So it's actually the Radeon GPU that makes that a little bit better with the older API, but let's take a look at how the 3080 and 6800 XT compare. Using these faster GPUs, we see that both the 6800 XT and RTX 3080 perform much better when using Vulkan with all three CPUs. However, we also see a situation where DirectX 11 performance for the RTX 3080 is slightly better with the slower CPUs. We're looking at a 6% uplift with the 9400F and a 2% uplift with the R5 1400. Certainly not the massive 20% gains we were seeing when going the other way in DirectX 12 titles, but you can see that the Nvidia driver is working better in DX11. The shadow of the Tomb Raider performance is horrible using DX11. Basically, the village where we test is very CPU intensive, and with DX11 unable to properly utilize these CPUs, performance tanks compared to DX12. Here we're looking at a situation where the R5 1400 was 23% faster with 5600 XT when compared to the RTX 2060 using DX12, but 12% slower using DX11. So again, Nvidia does better relative to AMD when using DX11, but performance is so bad here that it really doesn't matter. You'd clearly use DirectX 12 as it offers around twice the performance with an R5 1400. The issue is significantly more pronounced with the faster 6800 XT and RTX 3080. There's just simply no way you'd want to use the DX11 API in this title. The Watch Dogs Legion results are quite a bit different to what we've seen previously, though I would caution against drawing too many hard conclusions from this data, as the game did launch with DirectX 12 support, and that is the primary API used for this title. So I'm quite sure that neither Ubisoft nor AMD put much or perhaps any effort into optimizing Radeon's DirectX 11 performance in this title. The 5600 XT, for example, performed better using DirectX 12, particularly with the R5 1400, which was 20% faster using the more modern API. However, quite interestingly, we see the opposite with the RTX 2060. Here, the R5 1400 was up to 22% faster using DX11. In fact, the RTX 2060 DX11 performance was similar to what we see with the 5600 XT in DirectX 12, though DirectX 11 does suffer from considerably poorer frame time performance. Then with the high-end RTX 3080 and 6800 XT, we see that for the best performance, you'll want a 6800 XT running in the DX12 mode. The Ryzen 5 1400 and Core i5 9400F performance is comparable using the RTX 3080 and DirectX 11, though at times the 1% low performance does suffer. This was particularly true with the RTX 3080, where the 1% low performance was limited to 77 FPS, making the 6800 XT 52% faster. Overall performance was much more consistent for the RTX 3080 when using DirectX 12. So that was a lot of data, but I hope now it's a bit easier to understand when and where you might run in to the Nvidia driver overhead. In short, it's primarily an issue for CPU demanding DirectX 12 titles, which I feel could be a growing concern for Nvidia as we're receiving more and more DirectX 12 games, which will no doubt continue to become increasingly CPU demanding.
Of course, as games become more and more CPU demanding, more powerful CPUs will also become available. That's just natural progress. But that's also not really the point, as gamers on the cutting edge of PC hardware need not worry about the driver overhead issue, as it's never going to affect them. They're always going to have plenty of CPU headroom to spare. But for those of you using mid-range CPUs from previous generations, think Ryzen 5 2600, 3600, Core i5 10400 and so on, this will become an issue for those users, like what we're seeing now with the Ryzen 5 1600 and Core i5 9400F, and so on. Even then though, you really do need to be chasing every last frame your system is capable of for the Radeon GPUs to be of benefit. If you're a 60 FPS gamer, or you prefer to target high resolutions and quality settings over frame rate, then you are far more likely to end up being GPU limited, and the driver overhead shouldn't be an issue. Where having a Radeon GPU can be a benefit and enable around 20% greater performance is when you're playing a CPU demanding DirectX 12 title and you want to maximize performance by lowering the quality settings. I should also note that this can also be true for DirectX 11 games, but the game needs to fully utilize all cores before the GeForce driver overhead rears its ugly head. And that's not something you're going to see with most DirectX 11 games. I'm still not entirely sure how the driver overhead impacts Vulkan performance given the limited amount of games that we have for testing or have tested so far, and those games aren't very CPU demanding or they're not hugely CPU demanding. But from what I have tested, it appears to be a lot less of an issue when compared to what we're seeing in DirectX 12, and there are a few technical reasons for this that I won't get into in this video. At the end of the day, I feel this information is really best applied to budget builders and secondhand shoppers looking for lower end hardware, as a Radeon GPU can enable considerably greater performance, and perhaps more importantly, smoother gaming performance. And that is going to do it for this one. Again, I hope you guys found this useful. It was a huge amount of testing. I know there's always more hardware configurations and games that would be good to test, and maybe we'll do a bit more of that in the future. But I think we're mostly done for this one for now. Uh, for future sort of low-end mid-range GPUs, I may do two reviews, one with a high-end a flagship CPU and then one with a sort of lower-end mid-range type CPU. So that could be interesting. Anyway, that's all stuff for another day. Again, hope you appreciate it and enjoyed it. And if you want to join the Harbor Unboxed community, you can do so over at Floatplane or Patreon. Links for those are in the video description. You get access to monthly live streams with Tim and myself. Q&As, behind the scenes videos, a private Discord chat, very cool place to hang out and chat. So if you're interested in that stuff, check those links out, but if not, perfectly fine. And I would like to just thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.